So, getting triggered. How many of you, how many of us have ever gotten triggered ever in your entire life? I have my hand up. I have my hand up. That's for darn sure. And so what do I mean by getting triggered? I mean, something has happened and there's this invasive blah, reaction to it. I'm not talking here about the slow boil. I'm not talking about a background feeling of, of blue mood or anxiety. I'm talking about something acute. And often this something that's acute is a minor little thing. My long suffering wife, uh, was, uh, you know, raining on my parade microscopically yesterday about something I was thinking of doing or wanted to do. And brr, I could just feel the trigger, like, brr. I grew up with parents who rained a lot on the parade because they were anxious coming out of the Great Depression in which they grew up under really pretty tough conditions. So we get triggered. We can also get triggered in ways that are that are enormous and very understandable. Um, being assaulted, being attacked, being just floored by somebody else who's done something. Wow. What do we do? And I want to be clear going into this that I'm not implying, I'm not implying that our reaction is wrong or bad or um, out of proportion to what happened. Sometimes we get triggered uh, when we really, really are stunned by some kind of injustice. We're just blown away by it. We're triggered. Okay, then what? So I'm gonna offer some things here. I'm gonna tick through the obvious ones quickly because you probably know it already. So what's the value to add here other than encouraging you and me to practice what we actually know? That's a good start. Uh, for me included. Uh, but beyond that, I want to kind of focus on some things that may not be so obvious, or I want to really emphasize some things that may have become sort of a cliche in your mind and yet really, really matter. So here we go, and then we'll open it up. All right. So you get triggered. Step one is to notice that you're triggered rather than just being carried away by it. Oh, I'm triggered. There's a lot of research that's remarkable about the power of just naming the experience we're having at the time. Uh, people use sayings like name it to tame it or name it, don't shame it. Probably some of the haiku writers in the chat sidebar will come up with a haiku or two here. Um, just acknowledge, recognize to yourself, oh, I'm really pissed off, or I'm just shocked, or I feel like I just got punched right under my rib cage. Oh, I can hardly breathe, or whoa, I don't know what to do, or wow, I'm scared. You know, just try to name it to yourself. What is it? You know, just recognizing that you've gotten triggered. That itself is super valuable. And there's research that shows, for example, in your brain that just naming, just recognizing that you've gotten upset with the beginning of some understanding about it um, can increase activity in prefrontal regions right behind your forehead that are involved in sort of self-control, self-regulation, and making good plans. And also just naming, just identifying, oh, I'm really upset about this. Oh, I feel really hurt. Um, is really good in terms of calming down the amygdala. Now, you may, the amygdala being the, the alarm bell of the brain, among its other functions. Now, you may also, with some practice, be able to name fairly quickly or recognize fairly quickly what lies beneath surface reactions. I mean, I'm definitely going to talk about here, talk about anger here, certainly. And often under the anger is hurt or fear, or frustration, or some kind of bodily issue of fatigue, or being hungry, or in pain. So 
Sometimes you can recognize, oh, what's underneath it all, with some familiarity with yourself, like I have with my own you know, neurotic layers. Uh, when your partner or whoever does something, you can maybe fairly quickly recognize that, yeah, I'm triggered by what they did, but really what's going on is those old memories of having my parents rain on my parade as a kid. Uh, whoop, that's what's getting triggered here. So step one, recognize. I've gotten triggered. And see if you can just sort of own it in an accepting, straightforward way. Huh. Triggered. Second, really useful, pause. Tara Brock talks about the sacred pause. I think about what you may be aware of as the so-called amygdala hijack in your brain, in which essentially, as sensory information comes into the brain, uh, from our environment or comes into the brain from within us in terms of our body sensations or even, you know, psychodynamic processes bubbling away in the murky depths like, sw like swamp gas, <laughs> finally <laughs> popping up in, into, the, uh, uh, into the open air of, of awareness. Whatever it might be, when that stuff, you know, bubbles up, uh, it tends to get processed very quickly by ancient subcortical regions, notably the amygdala and the hippocampus, that within half of a second have sorted it based on old instinctual patterns and deep kind of intensive emotional, typically negative emotional learning, and start already to initiate a reaction in the first half second or so. Meanwhile, that sensory information is following a second neural highway. It's the slower boat highway reaching the prefrontal regions a second or two or three later after the amygdala has gotten its head start. Now, it's not a really, really slow boat. It gets there you know, a second or two or three later, but if you're already swept away by that amygdala-centered subcortical ancient 200 million-ish year old beginning evolution of that part of the brain reaction, burp, then your prefrontal cortex is trotting behind, you know, the runaway fire engines, you know, blazing away, uh, saying, wait, wait, wait for me. But it's kind of too late sometimes. And we're already creating damage to other people, to our environment, even to ourselves. So if you pause, my second big suggestion here, you just slow it down. You give yourself the gift of time. You buy yourself a little time for those really more powerful, but slower, more recent in evolution parts of your brain to catch up to what's happened and to start sorting things out a little bit. Like what really happened? You know, in the traditional example in the Buddhist early suttas is that thing that I've jumped back from lying there in the path, is it a snake or is it simply a rope or a vine that looks like a snake? If you give yourself that pause, you give yourself a chance to, whoa, slow it down and see what's going on. Now that pause, depending on the situation, might be only three, four seconds long before you mobilize what to do, depending on the situation that's triggered you. Often though, you know, we have some time. We have a minute. We have maybe an hour or day even to gather some facts and to sort out what was going on. In my little example, my pause gave me time to kind of look at my wife's face and see, oh, she's a little tired. And, oh, she's, you know, as usual, right <laughs> about one of my schemes. And, she doesn't bear me any ill will. Now, all that could happen within just a handful of seconds, but I could give myself the time to do it. And in much the same way, when you give yourself the right to pause, you know, we often feel like we somehow have to respond immediately when people say things, or they come at us in ways, frankly, that have a sense of demand in them. You know, the phone rings, the text pops up in your phone. I've had friends that have texted me, and then if I don't respond in a few minutes, they call me on the phone. Did you see my text? Yeah, I saw your text. So what? <laughs> I don't mean that in a mean way, but I mean, yeah. Do you think I'm obligated to respond immediately? It's not an emergency. 
like your inquiry, your whatever it is, phone call, text, email, is not necessarily an obligation upon me or to turn it around. If other people are, you know, saying things to you or asking you questions or wanting you to hop to it, hmm, are you actually obliged all of the time? You know, the word oblige, to be obligated, has in its roots, I looked it up, it has to do with a response to one's liege lord from medieval times when basically the duke or the count or the king, you know, you had to jump to it and obey. But do we really have that relationship with most, even all, of the people in our lives today? So buying yourself the time, the, some time and reminding yourself you have the right not to respond immediately just because someone wants some kind of quick response from you. That's my second suggestion here. Third is to definitely mobilize some compassion for yourself. If you're triggered, you're suffering. There is suffering right there, right there. And maybe the trigger has reactivated a whole stack of prior suffering that's pulled up and alive and well, and right there on the table inside yourself. Sometimes a lot of suffering there. As you would for another person, can you find it in your heart to recognize your suffering and to kind of feel it? Like, oh yeah, suffering. That's the empathic element of compassion. And also, huh, can you find some some caring that you're suffering, some kindness for yourself, some warmth, some sympathetic concern, often very quickly, kind of a, oh, ouch, oosh, I wish I didn't suffer, ooh, ooh. You're not wallowing in self-pity to take a few seconds for self-compassion. You're just finding a kind of warmth for yourself, much as you would find a kind of warm heart strong heart for somebody else who's suffering. It's very important to kind of call this out, this quality of warmth for yourself. You're mobilizing the social engagement system in effect in your brain for one being, in this case you, who's triggered. Really helpful to bring compassion for yourself. This too could be just a handful of seconds, or you might take some real time for it. You know, somebody's done something, it's triggered you, you recognize you've been triggered, number one. Number two, you pause to sort it out, you know, restrain overreactions that are going to get you in trouble, like pouring gasoline on the fire. And you pause to give yourself time to see clearly the larger context, what's happening here. And then you bring some, some compassion to yourself, some warmth to yourself. You might take hours, days to really just focus on the compassion for yourself, for the suffering that's happened in you in what you've been triggered about. And then fourth, in my suggestion to you, and this is what I do, it's kind of first aid for triggers. Fourth, you find a, kind, a feeling of getting on your own side. Wait a minute here, what? You start to, okay, you start to mobilize a strength a sense of fortitude or grit, determination. You're for yourself. You're on your own side. You're, it's kind of muscular. You know, if the, um, if the pause part involves a bit of self-restraint and if the warmth part, the compassion part is very kind of tender and a little gushy maybe for yourself, mm, this fourth part is kind of muscular. It doesn't mean you're getting into aggressiveness or hatred for others. Uh, but there's a kind of muscularity to it. You're on your own side. And tapping into that quality of being on your own side is a really, really useful thing to give yourself permission to do, especially if you have grown up in a way or you belong to a group of people in society who, in effect, have had their power uh, disempowered. They, the, they've been blamed for their own situations. They've been treated in ways that maybe have made them feel relatively helpless to deal with broad structural systemic features. Or maybe they've been told that their power um, scares other people. 
or it's not fill in the blank. It's not a proper way to be. Uh, you know, if that's at all present for you, giving yourself permission really to find that muscular stance is, is very, very important. I enjoy reading these um, stories, really, in the suttas, the teachings that come from early Buddhism that have to do with the Buddha interacting with people. And all these characters, <laughs> wild characters, came to approach him when he was living in different places, in forest groves or, or wandering about. And they would come to him often to do Dharma battle with him. And, you know, they came in sort of like as upper class Brahmins of the time, or they would come to him as sort of religious eccentrics, different kinds, you know, feeling like they needed to practice by being acting like a dog or practicing while wearing bark cloth or various other kinds of things. And so the interactions between him and them are quite interesting. What's, it, what's interesting is I would say the Buddha did not suffer fools gladly. He was quite direct. Uh, you know, there are phrases uh, that have survived coming down to us over 2,500 years that begin, you know, or teachings that begin, oh, foolish man, right? <laughs> you know, pretty direct. And yet they weren't caustic. They weren't mean. They weren't contemptuous. There was no contempt in it. But there was a muscular clarity in what he was pointing out as unwise or untrue in or unhelpful in, in what these other people were saying. And I figured to myself, if such a champion of self-regulation and loving kindness for all beings, omitting none, if such a champion of that could so clearly mobilize a kind of muscular quality for the good and a muscular quality on his own behalf, I think, you know, maybe I can do that too. So quick review, and you can really think about this, applied to particular situations that trigger you, large or small. It could be that you're rolling along and suddenly you hear something or see something in the news, or you get an email, or as has happened to me recently, um, a friend has kind of revealed that something, we might be heading to something in our relationship that could be in which they could feel let down by me or there could be some awkwardness uh, in ways maybe we're also working together. So I'm, I'm a little stirred up by that. You know? So you start, you recognize you've been stirred up. Slow it down. Second, pause. Third, bring some warmth to yourself. And fourth, find the beginnings at least of a stance that's sort of muscular in which you're on your own in which you're on in which you are on your own side now i confess i have been searching for an acronym for those first four steps and there will be a special dharma prize for anyone among you who's able to turn them into some kind of clever word with four letters in it uh, i haven't yet been able to do that but i invite your help okay fifth Make a plan. What are you going to do? Right? What are you going to do about this thing that's triggered you? Are you going to confront the person? Are you going to realize that being triggered is based on an assumption about them that you've come to see as you slow it down and kind of calm down your own reactivity? And you presumed that they were at fault or they did something wrong when in fact, no, they just shared something that happened to bump into one of your red hot buttons. Uh, I have a friend who quotes a saying uh, for himself, you know, essentially, he, I'll say it like this myself. I am responsible for bumping into one of your buttons. And I acknowledge that. And I'm going to try to learn from that. And I did not install those buttons in you. You acquired them yourself, and maybe you had a hand yourself in installing them. See the distinction? Sometimes we realize that the action we're going to take in our plan is to sort out our intentions from the impact on others, not to be glib, not to ignore our impacts on others, including our unwitting or clueless or even well-intended 
and yet understandable in retrospect, impact on others. But it's really helpful to sort it out. There's a kind of uh, sometimes belief we bump into these days in kind of mental health world or mindfulness world or social justice world in which people basically say, if I feel upset, you upset me. Well, it's more complicated than that, right? Often. Yeah, I do feel upset. And yeah, you said or did something. And yeah, whatever you said or did was mediated by a whole bunch of other things probably that led to me getting triggered. So when we make a plan, sometimes our plan includes sorting out, you know, what was actually caused problematically by that other person, really. You know, as we sort out what happened here, what do we consider with you know, mature judgment or some reflection? Aha, uh -huh, that was the issue in what they did. And then maybe, what's the rest? Also, when we form a plan, it could take time to form a plan. You know, it, we might have um, an immediate step. We're gonna step back in this relationship. We're gonna hang up the phone. We're gonna not watch that news channel so much. Um, you know, we're going to eat some food before the next time we interact with that person. Uh, we're gonna get better prepared at work maybe before we go into a meeting. We're gonna make a plan. Maybe part of the plan is to bring in allies. We wanna reach out and get some advice, maybe from an attorney, or we wanna look up some things online, or check in with some other people, or ask a friend, or talk with a teacher. We wanna get some allies on board us. That's part of our plan. Uh, Maybe the plan includes just reminding ourselves the next time, aha, uh -huh, next time that sort of thing happens, this is actually how I wanna be, a plan. I, you know, I've been a therapist for a super long time and uh, just remarkably, I'm just so struck by the fact that many of the issues that we have in our life could be managed by taking some kind of skillful action, reasonable range skillful action. Keep certain food or drink out of your house. Uh, have your own transportation <laughs> you know, when you go home for the holidays. Uh, you know, um, Find out some information that would be useful to you. Get a second opinion about this medical issue that's really concerning you and you're not so sure about what you've heard so far from the professionals you're dealing with. Just take action. There's no replacement for action well-planned, sustained, step-by-step -step action. That doesn't mean we have to get all busy and crazy and you know, exhaust ourselves, but it's very helpful. Think about the Buddha in his own life. Think about the skillful action he took again and again, moving from place to place, communicating with different people, establishing a whole community, establishing guidelines and rules for people to practice. You know, the action he took was mainly that of a teacher developing this whole body of teachings over his roughly 40 year teaching career. It took a lot of action, you know, for a contemplative who probably spent a lot of hours in the day just meditating and being. So it's okay to take action. It's okay to form a plan and to kind of know what you're going to do. Angela Sarian had a saying that I'll paraphrase as action binds anxiety. Action binds anxiety. When we know what we're going to do, even if it's just to live to see the sunrise uncomfortably, stuck on a mountain ledge, Mount Whitney, as I had to spend the night once in October when it was really cold with my feet in my backpack, sitting on my ropes, shivering under a space blanket with my friend. Um, you know, we had a plan and we trusted our plan and we knew we would live to see the sunrise. And then our plan would be to get down <laughs> to our tent and then take it from there. So those are the five. And I'll maybe pause here and I'll then offer a concluding comment and then open it up, see what you have to say. Okay, so quick summary, right? Notice you're triggered. Pause, slow it down. Warmth, compassion for yourself. A sense of being you know, muscular on your own behalf, and then make a plan. Know what you're gonna do, if only make a plan to make a plan when you have a little more time to make it. All right, so those for me are really useful in terms of being triggered. And uh, the last thing I wanna say here is kind of big picture. 
it's really helpful whether it's when you step back or when you're compassionate for yourself or when you're bringing forward a muscular response on your own side or you're starting to form your plan, I think it's really helpful to connect the personal to the political in the broadest sense. In other words, many of the factors that have stressed us, even traumatized us over our life, Many of the factors that make our life harder or that make life harder for other people who then in turn make life harder for us, many, 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 many of the sources of feeling bad inside our own home really originate on the other side of the front door. They're out there in society. They're out there in history, in culture, in our economy and the assumptions in our culture. We've seen, for example, in the last several years, even amidst you know, developments that are quite positive in certain regards, you know, in terms of knowledge about healthcare, medicine, science, um, recognition more and more of how interconnected we are in this world. Still, clearly, you know, we live in a society that's speeding up, that's invasive with its media, politics has gotten white hot. It reminds me of the Spinal Tap movie where, you know, the volume only went up to 10 and they just put a little 11 there and said, we take our volume up to 11. Well, these days you think it can't get any more intense. It can't get any crazier. It's already dialed up to 19, right? And then burp, next thing you know, it's 20. It's helpful to appreciate without having to develop a complicated you know, neo-Marxist formulation of late-stage capitalism and its invasive impacts on individuals, which is all true, of course, but beyond that, it's just a recognition that we're connected. We're connected to society. We're connected to culture. We're connected to economic pressures. We're connected to other people that are squeezed and burdened and pressured themselves in all sorts of ways. And there's something that happens when we locate ourselves in a larger whole both in the ways that in this larger whole are forms of support, forms of support that we haven't really been paying much attention to, like literally just the beautiful support of the natural world and the amazingness of what's evolved on our planet in this little tiny skin of air, roughly five miles up, you start edging into outer space. There's this little 10 mile, roughly, let's say, atmosphere inside of which all life is happening. Wow, and so much has developed so that we can be here. You know, recognizing that is good. On the other hand, it's also helpful to recognize how we're related to many powerful forces that are not really good for health and well-being. And part of what we're dealing with inside of ourselves originated outside of ourselves. And recognizing that can help you not blame yourself. It can help you appreciate that it's not your fault, um, that you feel these ways or have these reactions, while appreciating, hmm, the world is what it is. And if it's getting better in some ways, it's doing so pretty slowly. Meanwhile, rescue is not coming. And even if the reactions inside me are not my fault in some sense, they are my responsibility to deal with, including in the ways that I've talked about here so far. The last thing I'll say about this is a teaching from the great Zen master, Yunmen. It's one of my favorite Zen teachings. Yunmen was, was asked, what is it when trees wither and leaves fall? He replied, body exposed in the golden wind. Body exposed in the golden wind. Like all Zen stories, there are so many layers to this, so many ways you can explore it, keep exploring it. Golden wind is capitalized often. And so you have the, the sense of the wind of, of autumn. You have a sense also of something golden and beautiful. And you also have a sense of the winds. We live exposed to the winds of praise and gain, uh, praise and blame rather, gain and, and loss, pleasure and pain, 
fame and ill repute, we, we're exposed to being triggered. We cannot live without being vulnerable to being triggered. We are exposed to all the winds, and that's what's involved in life. And there can be a kind of sense of common humanity in being triggered, a sense that we evolved a body that's triggerable. It doesn't mean letting other people off the hook. It doesn't mean dismissing or pushing away your own suffering. It just means locating the suffering and the triggeredness that's an inevitable aspect of living exposed to the golden winds. If we are to enjoy the winds that are warm and sweet, and smell of cinnamon and balm, uh, we must also be exposed to the winds that are cold, cruel, penetrating, harsh, sometimes fatal. And that's part of life. And recognizing that fact and not resisting that fact while doing what we can for ourselves and others is uh, a really useful pathway into a profound underlying inner peace. Okay. So I see hands. I'm going to tend to prioritize people who I haven't seen before, just not to uh, be mean or anything, but I'm just going to do that a little bit. So I think I'm going to start with you, Larry. I don't recall you speaking up before. I'm asking you to unmute. <coughs> what do you think? And as always, if you could, short, concise question relating to what have we what we've been talking about. Yeah, thank you. Um, I was really drawn to tonight's topic because it's an ongoing challenge I have not to be reactive. Um, with my young adult daughter um, who was living with me. And, um, and so um, what I find, so my question is, um, you know, I understand, you know, I, I, I get this and it, you know, makes sense to me, but, um, you know, certainly, you know, it, it, I'm wondering if you would consider an amendment or variations on the recipe, if you will. Yeah. Um, in particular, um, on number three, um, oh no, number two, <clears throat> mobilizing compassion. That's number um, three. Number three. Oh, oh number right, two right. Is... That is three. Right. There we are. Right. Naming it. Right. Yeah. Pausing, because um, um, you know this is so hard. Um, you know we trigger each other, yeah. um, and it you know and, and the work that we're both trying to do is you know, preserve the love and the relationship and not re-traumatize each other uh, by upping the ante. So I guess my question is for number three, um, I find, and this comes from other talks that you and others have on uh, uh, mobilizing, like, well, if I can be compassionate for myself, it's like, oh, like, she's really upset right now, like being compassionate towards, having compassion for her, even though in that moment, I mean, I'm really being attacked. So it's hard. So Larry, to, let me slow you down here. Yeah. Just, and I'll be kind of quick. Can you, can you find compassion for yourself while you're triggered? While you're triggered, yes or no? Can you find compassion for yourself? In those moments, Often not. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, okay, so we're just naming opportunity, right? You know, it's kind of like a checklist. Check that good. Check that good. Oh, self-compassion. Room to grow, <laughs> right? Okay, so, right, so far. Um, that might be helpful. The other thing that I just want to share, someone who has adult kids too, You know, it's to really choose your spots and to realize, you know, in my case, I kind of realize I get about four times a year where I can give advice that will be received. And so that means <laughs> I have to wait three more months after the last one. You know, there's just choose your spots. I think that's something to think about. And that has to do with people in general. It's to realize that, uh, you know, very often we can let them be. I mean, if they're doing something immediately dangerous or harmful, or, you know, okay, so we speak up. 
But often there's a place, I think, for just letting people be and resting in. And this, I have a hunch, might help, be helpful for you. Resting in a deep knowing of what a teacher of mine once called a blessing disposition, where you're seeing the good in the other, you have sincere, you're aware of your own sincere love and care, and just rest in that without moving into problem solving or defending or complication. I don't know if that would be helpful to you, but I think that's often helpful for people in general to have the, the felt knowing of their own sincerity. Well, no, it's, yeah, I guess I didn't provide enough context or detail. I mean- That's okay, because I have to move on anyway, but yeah. I was being attacked, so that doesn't really speak to- Uh-huh, well, yeah. when you're- That's what I was trying to- Yeah, I, I see. You were being attacked, and you're trying to sort out what to do in the moment of the attack. Well, was it truly an attack, or- Yes. Uh, did it feel appropriate to listen, or did it feel appropriate to just stop and walk away? Um, yeah, I try it. It was, um, no, it, it was appropriate to stop and walk away. Okay. And that's a pretty heavy duty thing to do, obviously with a, with a family member, but maybe that's appropriate. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah. There's more to it, obviously, than we have time for here. But what I'm, what I'm hearing is that sometimes right there in the moment you're triggered, the best thing you can do is to pause through disengaging. And that's, tricky sometimes to do with a family member. Uh, over time, we can sometimes help ourselves to stay in, in place while being attacked and not be so flooded, but that's something we develop over time as a trait, maybe in the history. Now I, now I get it more deeply. I, I do think that, um, yeah, it's families. I mean, you know, it's okay, like fight it. or flight. Yeah. You know, and you don't want to be there, but for sure. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I know. I wish you the best, and I, I got it. Um, just, I, I do think that the, you know, maybe it's later. Self compassion is really good, and, you know, it's been really good for me actually to amidst a sorrowful feeling of my own mistakes as a dad. And I'm not saying you made any mistakes. I'm just saying from myself. Well, we all do. <laughs> amidst them, right. Amidst that sorrowful recognition and amidst also maybe an angry attitude toward, hey, what do you mean? You know, the, how this other person is treating me. To know and to kind of take refuge in, wow, even amidst all that, I never stopped loving you. And to tune into the sincerity, not in a glib way that avoids a searing self-examination, you know, that AA saying a, fearless, a searching fearless inventory, you know, of oneself, but, but still can take refuge in knowing your own sincerity. That's a really important thing. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. All right, so uh, I'm gonna, Christina, uh, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Great. Okay. So um, my question is, and you touched upon it, um, that our triggers are oftentimes fed by past childhood experiences. Yeah. And so I'm just curious, oftentimes what we are experiencing in the present moment are based on distortions that we have from these childhood experiences. And I'm just curious with like step number four, Yeah. how does the, what would you do with the distortions in terms of how to create that scaffolding or that muscular? Well, if I follow you right, and I, I've known many people, and I'll just kind of make a generalization here about gender, much more often women than men in our culture, girls and, and women, uh, while recognizing obviously there, there are many people for whom gender categories don't, don't fit particularly, but that said as a generalization, girls and women are often socialized to feel that this muscular stance on their own behalf is not allowed. So. That might be something you're speaking to, I don't know, uh, in your own background. Um, and I don't know if that's true. I'm just kind of wondering if as a belief. So one of the things we can do over time, of course, is to be aware of it in the moment. And I find it's actually helpful, I don't know, for me at least, to imagine that I'm kind of looking at myself from more of a bird's eye view 
third person impersonal perspective and basically imagining that um, other beings that I respect even are looking also at me and saying what would be just, what would be fair, what would be a kind of universal common humanity sort of um, permission even encouragement or a healthy entitlement for that person, me, who like others is entitled to that, to being on your, your own side. So if I follow you right, that might be something there. Another thing that's very useful about this sense of a musket or being on your own side, which is really missing for many people, or it's very weak or it's, it's scary. They're afraid of going there because when they did go there as a kid, that was sure punished. Yeah. So it's to look for other areas in your life, maybe outside of whatever is triggering or even outside of relationships where you can tune into a, a sense of inner, a kind of a muscular strength on your, own, on your own behalf. Maybe a time when you were just doing things that were physical, like holding a yoga pose or running or jogging or being in wilderness, uh, or maybe a time when you were strong for somebody else. That could be an easy access. And then you know what it feels like to be determined, loyal, uh, you know, uh, fierce, fierce compassion, Kristen Neff talks about for them. And then you could apply that to yourself, maybe. Am I am I speaking to the question here? I in part, I think the the piece that I struggle with is do you want, you know, how it's it's assessing that distortion piece, because do you really want to come back? If you're distorted and don't, you're not based in reality. You're based. You're 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 interacting with that person based on your past experience. And Sorry, so, what's a distortion? So Mind specifically um, and briefly, what's a distortion? Um, it's kind of like when you project onto somebody. Whatever. So what does that have? What does that have to do with forming a muscular response? I guess I'm not clear on what a muscular response, like I'm feeling like a muscular response is coming back with a response to the trigger. Um, and I guess my question is, is like tangling out to ensure that the distortion, or for example, if I'm, if I'm upset because someone, so my, my situation today, um, I take care of my mom ha a lot of the, the week. She's, she's not doing well. My sister flew in, she's been here um, twice in the past four years and she's here for a week. And so as soon as she landed, she says, well, I'm gonna need all kinds of support. And my trigger was, what? <laughs> like, Let me make a distinction here. I think that I may not have been so clear about. I'm distinguishing between uh, this kind of mobilizing a sort of basic muscular stance for yourself, I'm distinguishing that from being assertive in a muscular way at other people. There's a, there's a difference. And I'm also talking often about sort of mental events that take only seconds. They, 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 um, they proceed for just a handful of seconds before we move on to the next good thing. But it's important that they were there. Right. So let's say your sister says that here you are. I mean, I heard the tone in your voice. Right. You know, you came out twice in four years. You know, my sister. Right. And uh, uh, get it. And uh, here she is already telling you she needs more. And you're already burdened. You're already doing so much taking care of your mom. Right. So it's understandable. So what might happen is she says that and it's irritating and unnerving and Probably there'd be maybe a larger history of her being over entitled and you know being demanding. Oh, okay, great, right? So you recognize that maybe you slow it down just a second or two or three. Maybe you're driving. You don't want to speak up yet. Then with a little self awareness, now we're five seconds in. You you feel a kind of tender for yourself, like oh there she goes again. Here I am. I'm already carrying a lot. You know, I'm dealing with so much already. I'm already fried and you want more? Whatever, you know, that's there. And then on the heels of that, now we're about nine seconds in, maybe I'm making it up, like harumph. <laughs> I think that sense of being for ourselves sometimes has this sort of harumph <laughs> in it where we're just like, hmm, you know, 
I think of Gandalf, right, in the Lord of the Rings story at the Bridge of Baradur. Brum, you will not pass. You know, there's that certain, we're just, we're for ourselves. We're not going to war with them. We're not moving into some evilness toward them. We're, and uh, interestingly, as we ground, it can feel grounding. I could maybe use other words like grounding. Mm. We get rooted, we stabilize, we kind of plant. All the wish for me are this in this quality of being on your own side, being for yourself. Mm. As we stabilize and ground, we often feel that we actually don't need to get reactive or contentious or argumentative with the other person. It's almost like we can just sort of look at them and even find maybe some compassion for them and just let that go on by. We, we're not agreeing with them. We don't approve of what happened, but you know. And then you can move into making a plan already being stabilized. I'm so glad you brought this up, Christina, and we had a chance to kind of clarify this. Yeah, I think so, giving an example was, yeah. Yeah, that was key. I should ask for that. That was good. Okay, great. Well, gosh, we need to wrap up. I see you, uh, Malika. Um, I want to add, so sorry, Dan and Ed. I now know you, Ed, that's not Edge Hall. It's Ed G. Hall. I remember that from last time. I'm looking forward to that. So Malika, could we do this briefly? Is that okay? I'm asking you to unmute. And I may have mangled the pronunciation of your name, Malika, Malika. You pronounced it correctly. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Um, you really have touched on what I'm working with. And I, I got some wonderful pieces. Okay. Um, I have been working on resourcing myself. I'm in the second year of foundations. Oh, okay. And for me, it's a family issue. It's, mm. and, and very much like Christina, I'm an only child and I'm tending to my disabled mother. And we had a very difficult relationship growing up. Um, and when I walk through her back door, I turn into a little girl. Now I, and that it's just always been that way, but I've been really working on resourcing myself. I've been trying to exercise my inner Gandalf. I, um, I've been walking in, you know, after listening to you, I drive four hours to go be with her. I listen, wow. I listen to so much stuff and I think of all the things I'm grateful for. And, you know, I really try to resource. And initially I can hang in there. Yeah. And what really seems to happen is, um, and, and I've learned how to set some boundaries. I also am dealing with guilt. Um, because I'm not going to have her come and move in with me. Mm. Um, but what'll happen is invariably after I've hung in there, I've been able to just not respond to the criticisms or whatever it is that's coming up. But that little girl in me can only do that for so long. And I get so triggered and I become flooded and I, I so appreciated you saying that quote about that in the trigger is suffering. It's yeah. like, it is so painful. And it is so painful when I become flooded because I say really hurtful things, just mm -hmm. like a little girl would. And, and I just, I almost can't believe myself. Yeah. And I know that I, that really the, the salve, the anecdote is that self-compassion and whatnot. But honestly, I drive home in tears, feeling guilty along with the compassion. It's, right. and I don't, yeah. you know, I, there's nobody else to step in. That just happens to be the case. And, and I feel a, a very deep desire to be of assistance to her. Yeah. But there's times where you know, my plan, my plan would be duct tape. Yeah. yeah. I can, because then I really couldn't say anything. <laughs> no, it's true. And I, I, you know, I, 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 there's a bit of a trigger warning in what I'm about to say, but you may know this saying from the heavyweight 
champion Mike Tyson, uh, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And we, you know, we get punched in the mouth, including with our sensitivities, understandable to people we love. And um, so, well, I, f I really feel for you. And I can just tell you the amount of service you are offering for your mom, you know, the eight hour round trip journey, the time with her, the difficulty, the history, it's enormous. And alongside all that service might be some slips when you get to the end of your rope. I mean, so it's whatever those slips are, obviously, are compared to all that, all that goodness, and certainly in the present. If I could offer maybe one thing, and then I should wrap up if that's okay. Actually, two little things. One is to be aware in the, of the script-like nature of a typical visit as it unfolds, like a play in five acts. And it's in that third act or so, the fourth act, that you finally have had enough and you snap. And if you think about the typical interaction with the details changing, but it follows a kind of scripted like progression, are there things you can do when your needle starts swinging out of the green zone into the yellow and edging toward orange before it goes full red? Is there anything you can do in the kind of typical script of a visit to reset back to at least to yellow, if not to chartreuse, you know, yellow green? right? Um, can you do that? And that, that's one thing I think that can really make a difference. And it kind of, it basically it honors the animal body. It's like, of course we're exhausted. Of course we finally get fed up. Of course our amygdala <laughs> finally, you know, breaks out of containment and because the containment was just getting so frayed, you know, the, <laughs> the wolf breaks out. Of course. Because everything that held it in, in it, it held it in, has just gotten so worn down. So you might want to think about that in a very deliberate way, even making a little bit of a plan in advance. We're arranging things in the future. Arrange for friends to call you, you know, part way through the visit. Sorry, mom, got to take the call. Or, you know, I got to go to the bathroom. That's always a good one. I like that one. Or anything that gets you out that changes the script, maybe disrupts the normal sequence of a visit, gets her outside. Uh, the great uh, hypnotist, the great hypnotherapist, Milton Erickson, would do things where he would have people, I think there's even a book to this title, Change One Thing. If there's a familiar habitual, like you and she are kind of caught up in a habit, if you will, in a sense, change one thing to disrupt the script, if you can, so I would just say that. And then one last little suggestion is to just wrap yourself in a, a, a cloak of love, a kind of mantle, a cloak, an energy field, and you're just rested in love. That's, that's, that's all your job is. Your main job is just to be first and foremost, rest in love. And so it's not so much to solve her problems or to take care of her you know, laundry or to read her a story or to listen to her inter, you know, interminable story yet again. Just your job is to just be rested in love. And there's something that is kind of almost invulnerable and certainly self-feeding and self-protecting when we're rested in, in lovingness. I know that can be really hard with a difficult person, but it's kind of like you just start ignoring them. Not in a dismissive or contemptuous way, but you're just, you're just dialed into love. They're doing what they're doing. You're like a giant radiator of warmth radiating off from you. And they're moving through the field. You're like a big Wi-Fi base station, you know, base station Malika transmitting. You're just rested in love. They just do whatever they do. You're on the love channel. <laughs> you know, you're channeling it. It's moving through you. You feel it? It's just that's it. That's it. And it's not dependent. It's not contingent on it's not conditional on what's happening around you. You're just like beaming love, beaming love. You might even have a little mantra you just repeat to yourself, you know. A little Om or Shanti or love or, you know. I did the fire walk with Tony Robbins a million years ago. He was, cool moss, cool moss, cool moss, <laughs> whatever it might be. <laughs> okay, we better wrap up. 
Thank you. I wish you so goodness. You know, yeah, it's not perfect. And she's she's your golden wind, right? Guess what? Exposed to the golden wind. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you all. We covered a lot of ground. Thanks for hanging in there, all 376 of you. Um, take good care. Sorry, Ed. You know, sorry, Dan. Let's put you to the top. Dan, I always appreciate your haiku and all those other good good tidbits uh, of wisdom there. I hope you enjoyed that talk. I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free.